Hello and welcome to the Smoking and Mental Health webinar. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sari Khan and I'll be running the event behind the scenes and trying to get it to go as smoothly as possible. I'd like to share a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, so first of all, the session is being recorded and we'll share the link with you afterwards. Um, we also have a range of speakers who you'll be hearing from. And if you'd like to ask a question during the session today, we've got some time set aside for those and we'll try and get through as many as we can. So to, to ask a question or to share a comment, you'll see a blue button on the right hand side of your screen. Type your question in the box and then press send. Um, you can ask your question anonymously, but if you uh, want to add your name, then that's great so that we know who we're talking to. Finally, you can switch on subtitles and live captioning for the session. And to do this, just click on the CC icon on your video controls. So now I'm going to hand over to Jenny Houlihan, Tobacco Dependence Lead at NELFT, who'll be leading today's session. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Sarah. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to um, welcome you all and thank you very much for coming to our Smoking and Mental Health webinar. Um, we have some great speakers today, Debbie Robson, Zoe Townsend and Martin Lever, and we'll have some time for some questions at the end, which is fantastic. So the NHS long term plan and the commitment to re achieve a reduction in health inequalities, smoking accounts for approximately half of the difference in life expectancy between the lowest and highest income groups in England. And for every smoker who dies, another 30 are suffering from serious smoking related diseases. Smoking is the single largest cause of the gap in life expectancy. Stopping smoking has a beneficial impact on long term levels of depression and anxiety. People with mental health conditions die on average 10 to 20 years earlier than the general population. And across the UK, about 39 percent of people with severe mental illness smoke and some with conditions such as schizophrenia rises to 80 percent. For, for reasons, conventional approaches to stopping smoking might need to be tailored to people with um, serious mental illness. So, however, mortality does not give a complete picture of the burden of disease borne by individuals in different populations. The overall burden of disease is assessed by the disability adjusted life year. So smoking is the key risk factor attributed to each of the major six conditions. So chronic respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, neurological disorders, cancers, diabetes and musculoskeletal disorders or MSK. Despite falling rates in smoking prevalence, smoking remains the single largest cause of preventable ill health and death in the UK. The global burden of disease ranks tobacco as the top modifiable risk factor that drives death, death and um, disability. On average, smokers have difficulty carrying out everyday tasks like dressing, eating, walking across the room seven years earlier than their never smokers and need care support 10 years earlier than never smokers. People with severe mental illness begin smoking at a much earlier age and the higher incident than those without serious mental illness. So furthermore, compared with the general population, individuals with severe mental illness smoke every cigarette more intensely than they take more deeper inhalations, extracting a greater level of nicotine from each cigarette and are more dependent on nicotine and are more likely to develop smoking related diseases and less likely to receive help in quitting. Smoking is part of the culture of uh, mental health services among both staff and patients and many patients with severe mental illness are misinformed by health professionals about the risks and benefits of stopping smoking versus treatment for nicotine dependency and they fear and overestimate the medical risks of nicotine replacement treatments. Many individuals believe that in, uh, smoking relieves depression and anxiety. Whereas nicotine, in fact, increases anxiety. In addition, smoking is perceived um, to some to help alleviate depression, whereas a, symptom, um, a systematic review has found that smoking cessation can help reduce um, depression. It can um, be as helpful as using a, a, an antidepressant, which um, is quite impressive. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Debbie Robson to um, to speak now. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. So just get my slides up. 
So I'm uh, I'm a mental health nurse by background and I'm a senior lecturer in tobacco harm reduction uh, at King's. And in this slot, I'm going to cover, I'm going to look at that relationship between uh, smoking and poor mental health. So does smoking cause poor mental health or does poor mental health uh, lead to smoking? So I'm going to look at three broad areas of research that, that can answer this question and then say something about addressing barriers to implementing smoke free policies and treatment pathways in mental uh, health settings. So, uh, as you all know, uh, smoking prevalence in this country is the lowest that it's ever been uh, amongst the wider general population. And the government are working towards the ambition of a, a smoke free uh, society. So that means a prevalence of, of smoking of 5% or less. And we know from some work that we've done with the Royal College of Physicians that based on the previous rate of decline, if we just carry on as kind of business as usual, um, and it, those people living in the most deprived socioeconomic conditions, they're going to lag behind the 2030 smoke free target. So um, people in the most deprived uh, living conditions are likely uh, to reach 5% smoking prevalence after 2050. But we can't wait until 2050 for smoking prevalence to get down to 5% for people who experience the most disadvantage in society. Because while we're dragging our feet, um, particularly people with mental health problems, they're dying prematurely because of their high rates of smoking. Um, we looked at life expectancy amongst 21,500 patients in South London Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, and they had a smoking prevalence of 77%. And we were able to estimate that smoking was probably accounting for around half of the life expectancy gap in women with severe mental illness and about a, a third of the life expectancy gap in, in men with severe mental illness. So there's, let's have a look, if we look at the relationship between smoking and mental health and unpack this a, a bit, there's, there's three broad areas of research that have looked at it. So the first uh, hypothesis, which, which Jenny's already mentioned, is uh, the self-medication hypothesis, which suggests that people with existing poor mental health smoke to self-treat their mental health symptoms. Um, and particularly those that take medicines to treat psychosis, they smoke to reduce or cope with side effects of medication, particularly movement disorders. But when you look at the scientific evidence for, for this hypothesis, it's, it's, it's really weak uh, because we know that heavy smoking is actually associated with poor mental health. And as Jenny mentioned, your mental health improves when you stop smoking uh, and the longer you stop, the better your mental health gets. But this kind of self-medication hypothesis, historically, it's been used by clinicians, you know, including myself, not to intervene because we think that smoking somehow calms people uh, and stopping smoking will somehow make their mental health worse. When in fact, good mental health care and, you know, giving people kind of the best treatment and addressing the wider determinants of poor mental health, that's much better for treating mental health symptoms than um, cigarette smoking. The next hypothesis is the misattribution hypothesis, where people come to believe that smoking somehow reduces your stress. So nicotine gets to the brain really, really quickly, just within a few seconds when you puff on a cigarette, and that eventually leads to a boost of dopamine. Uh, dopamine is a teaching signal and, it, and when you have a boost of dopamine it can't your brain can't really tell you what's caused that boost of dopamine it just knows you need to repeat the action that's 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 gone before it so puffing on a cigarette so um nicotine it, it is both positive reinforcing because it, it, it's a teaching signal but it's negatively reinforcing because nicotine has a very very short half-life it doesn't stay in the body very long and if you don't top up your blood levels of nicotine then you'll get withdrawal symptoms so your mood will be depressed you'll get anxiety you'll be irritable and the quickest way to treat these symptoms is to have another cigarette so the brain's teaching the smoker to smoke when these symptoms uh, occur and people who smoke and often clinicians misattribute 
the ability of cigarettes to relieve withdrawal symptoms with their ability to reduce mental health symptoms. So what's actually uh, happening is your smoking doesn't reduce stress, but your replenishment of nicotine is reducing your withdrawal symptoms, which are misattributed uh, to stress. And then we know from observational studies, we know that the there's a bi-directional relationship between smoking and mental health. So depression increases the risk of smoking and smoking increases the risk of depression and similar uh, with schizophrenia. But these type of studies, they can't, can't tell us which comes first. They can't tell us does the mental illness come first or does the smoking come first and does one lead to the other? Uh, because there may well be other factors involved, so kind of shared factors that independently affect both smoking and poor mental health. So it might be to do with the environment or adverse childhood experiences or uh, other drug use. But recently, there's a growing body of research, uh, mostly coming out of uh, Bristol University, that um, takes into account a kind of genetic approach to, to help us understand the causes uh, of illnesses. And so what uh, this particular research methodology does, it, it groups millions of genes together from millions and millions of people, uh, and it's able to look at the genetic differences that affect behaviours, so for example, smoking and illnesses, so for example, schizophrenia, and it can help work out which comes first. Um, and so there's this growing body of evidence that um, people who smoke have an increased uh, likelihood of developing schizophrenia and depression in the first place. There's a bit of evidence around bipolar disorder. And we know that smoking gets in the way of mental health recovery because if you smoke, you have more severe symptoms of psychosis and depression, you spend longer time in hospital, uh, your blood levels of certain medicines um, are often lower, so you've got to have higher doses of medicines, it keeps people in poverty, it exposes people to additional exploitation and stigma, and people who smoke, they're more likely to, um, less like, well, less likely to use alternative coping skills and reach for a cigarette to cope. Whereas a smoke-free setting, um, it helps protect people who are non-smokers from secondhand smoke. It helps. So if you think about quite a few years ago before trusts went smoke free, a lot of people um, came into our psychiatric hospitals as non-smokers and they're left as 20 a day smokers. Um, if you provide tobacco dependence treatment and you provide it, you know, a lot of it, um, then it increases your chances uh, of quitting. And the longer a hospital stay in a smoke free setting, the higher the quit rate. And you're less likely to be readmitted if you're provided with tobacco dependence treatment support uh, and follow up. And as we previously said, quitting smoking is associated with improvement of depressive uh, and uh, symptoms of anxiety. So people who smoke who are kind of Poor mental health, they're locked in this kind of vicious cycle of perhaps taking up smoking um, or smoking, increasing the risk of poor mental health uh, in, in the first place, and then developing at high levels of, of tobacco dependence, which makes it much more difficult to successfully quit. And then you've got smoking causing physical symptoms likely to keep you in poverty and you're just kind of locked in this never ending cycle. We've got this growing body of evidence that smoking might make your mental health worse or it increases the risk of you having a mental health problem in the first place and quitting can improve your mental health. So in mental health settings, we need to make sure that there's the barriers to implementing smoke free policies are minimised as much as possible. And we've, we've done some work with, with colleagues in, in SLAM to try and address these concerns, such as, for example, staff believing that they just don't have time to treat tobacco dependence uh, or concerns that violence will increase or fires will increase uh, on wards. And we've been able to demonstrate, you know, over the past few years that um, you you can free up a lot of clinical time if you don't facilitate smoking. So we did one study where we looked um, 
across a number of wards, how much time staff were spending taking people out into ward gardens, uh, bringing them back in and storing the tobacco. And, and we worked out was it was equivalent of just over a month a day of clinical time on each ward that staff was spending facilitating smoking as opposed to helping people not smoke. We we looked at what was going on uh, in our rates of violence. So we looked at rates of violence 13 months before we went smoke free and 12 months after the trust went smoke free across 38 wards and found that found that rates of physical violence towards staff and patients reduced by uh, almost 40 percent. Uh, in the 12 months after going smoke free. And then we've also looked at fire incidents and found over an 81 month period, fires reduced by 65% when the trust had a much more permissive vaping policy and allowed all types of e-cigarettes rather than restricting the type of e-cigarette uh, device. And then finally, another point that Jenny made, um, we've looked at this kind of across the uh, kind of adult general population in, in about three and a half thousand uh, adults um, um, and some of those had um, severe mental distress or moderate uh, mental uh, distress in the previous 30 days and what we found that those with the most severe mental distress were less likely to have accurate harm perceptions about nicotine nicotine replacement therapy uh, and e-cigarettes. So there's, there's a big job to be done around educating patients about the helpfulness of, of alternative nicotine products um, to help them quit smoking. So that's me just to kind of sum up my section. So increasingly we have stronger evidence that smoking causes poor mental health and that quitting can lead to improved uh, and better mental health. We need to research this uh, much more. Um, as, as the more evidence that we, we, we garner uh, and collect that smoking contributes to poor mental health and makes it work, worse, the, the more we can do to change the culture of smoking in, in psychiatry. But kind of, I suppose more important is the implementation of evidence-based interventions, so preventing the uptake of smoking uh, and also delivering uh, smoking cessation interventions, because this is where we can have immediate and, and positive impact on the people that we work with. That's my bit and, I, and I'll pass you back to Jenny. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you very much, Deborah. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, what a great presentation and um, I'm, I'm really well well done. Um, I'd like to hand you over now to Zoe. Um, Zoe is part of our health and wellbeing team and um, Zoe has an exciting new project that's happening here at NELT. Thanks Jenny and wonderful slides um, Debbie. I don't think mine are going to be the same but I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone. So my name is Zoe Townsend. I am the lead occupational therapist for Haverin um, and I was supposed to be here today with my colleague Rob Ellis whose name is on the slides but unfortunately he's not well so I'm going to lead on this today. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about our Haverin SMI Stop Smoking service. Um, next slide please. Okay, so if I just give you a bit of um, background. So within NELFT, um, I, I work in Haverin and the Haverin Local Authority put out for a bid for support for people with SMI on stopping smoking. Um, so NELFT as a collective, and Jenny was involved in that, our chair today as well, um, came together to look at how we um, could look at putting a bid to support this. So as Jenny said, I work for the mental health um, wellness teams, uh, which in Haverin is the service that look after people that have secondary mental health services. Um, and we're a team made up of psychiatrists, um, community psychiatric nurses, psychologists, OT, social workers and support time recovery workers. Um, so we felt we may be in a good place that we could support this um, this bid. Um, we, we were lucky and we done really well. We put that bid in and it's hope we did win the bid and it's just being signed off at the moment. Um, and so what we have is an 18 month pilot, hopefully starting from April that we will be rolling out. Um, so within this bid, the way we've uh, with the funding that we were given, this needs to fund for um, any of the medication, vapes, any of the um, 
things that we're going to give out to our service users and also needs to fund the staff member that's going to be involved in this um, because we're going to embed them in our community mental health and wellness teams we haven't had to worry about you know uh, funding bases or whether the person's going to work they're going to work alongside us um, so over this 18 month pilot with this staff member we've uh, made an approximate guess that we're going to be able to ha hopefully help 60 clients in the community that have SMI um, that are in that live in Havering and we've worked this out with them being on a 12, 12 week program. We have a staff member that will only be working four days a week um, and we wanted to ensure that we gave good quality sort of support to 60 people rather than opening it up to too many and not being able to give that intensive support. Um, what we're hoping to do is utilise different approaches and identify new strategies in reaching out to this client group. Um, as Debbie and Jenny had mentioned before, this is a client group that can be quite difficult to engage. Um, and we're hoping with the skills that we have, we're already working with people in the community. Um, we can work in a different way to try and support this project. Um, again, we're going to offer a tailored approach uh, to support to make this one to one. Not everyone's going to want to work in the same way. So it'll be working that out with assessments. You know, some people may have home visits, some may be clinics um, and just making sure that we work individually for the people that we're supporting. Um, one of the other things we're hoping to do is offer some peer support and group support, especially for those maybe that are um, wondering if they want to be involved or not, if we've got some peers involved that can talk to them about, you know, how this worked for them, how they've, it's helped them stop smoking or reduce smoking, and also some group support um, for people that come to the end of that 12 week program to offer sort of post, post support for them. Okay, next slide, please. So how will we do it? So how are we going to try and do this within our mental health and wellness teams? Um, so what we thought was a good start is as we have people with SMI, a lot of them, and I think um, Debbie mentioned in hers as well, um, some of our clients are on clozapine or they may be um, on depot medication, which is injection. So they need to come to our, our offices for their clinics some monthly, some two weekly. So what we want to do is set this staff member up that's going to be doing this work alongside our clinics. One, it means our clients that are coming in have already got these appointments set up. They're used to coming in. So it's about not, not creating more work, more appointments for them that they may struggle to attend or be motivated to attend. Um, it'll be offering them when they come in, do they want to sit down and talk about stop smoking? Is it something they're interested in? Um, and using them appointments as a, as a means for them to come in and see us. Um, we also, because we have psychiatrists and our clients are on, on these medications and they are under um, a care program approach, they have six monthly meetings with psychiatrists and they'll be seeing their CPNs in the community monthly. So if they are um, using nicotine, we, we, we have access to psychiatrists to let them know about medications, let them know what we are in, increasing or reducing to ensure we're doing that safely and that people are aware of the risks or um, anything that may, that may be sort of joint to that. Um, again, we can see clients when they attend for their medical appointments. So when they come in to see the psychiatrist, that's six monthly. Again, if they're not on depot or clozapine, we have lots of clients that may just be on oral medication. We can ask them alongside these appointments as well. Um, some of the other work we want to do, so those clients that maybe don't come in to see the doctors that regularly, we could go out with their care coordinators and visit them in their home environments if they don't feel able to come out to us. That's something different we want to be able to offer rather than them having to come to appointments. Um, we've also got a lot of um, outreach work we want to do with our supported accommodations. So we have places where we have um, four to ten people living in um, accommodations where they're supported by sort of mental health staff and we want to go in and talk to them and the providers on how we can support people in stopping smoking. Um, we also can do some support in our clients in picking up medications, vapes, etc. from the pharmacies um, rather than expecting them to go actually give them that support and that motivation to get out and collect those. Um, we're also going to be taking referrals from across Havering um, into our mental health and wellness teams. As long as a person has a severe and enduring mental health condition, they can be referred into our services. Um, we also want to do some work alongside the acute services. So if people are there and it's identified um, that they want to stop smoking, that they, that link can be given to us out into the community so we can continue that piece of work. Next slide, please. And the measuring success, so this was part of the bid, what do we want to achieve uh, from the work that we're going to do? So what we ideally love is that, you know, the number of people uh, that will reduce the quantity of their cigarettes they're smoking. Um, we want to see the number of people partially switching to vapes. 
um, the number of people completely switching to vapes. And then also the number of, of people achieving a quit between four to 12 weeks and the number of people remaining abstinent or continued reduction in harm uh, for six months post, the, post what we're going to offer. Um, the other thing that I think big for us as a mental health and wellness team that we want to see is even if people will engage in this, that they'll come along to the first appointment and actually talk about stops, stopping smoking. We're also very aware that this won't be very linear. People may start, then want to leave. So although we're saying 12 weeks, we're quite, um, we know that this may take longer for some people. They may want to drop out and come back in. And that's something we're quite open to. Um, even if we can help one or two people actually quit smoking or reduce and move on to vapes, I think that's going to be really good for our client our client group. And that's why we wanted to support it here in Haverham. Yeah. Next slide. I think that's all my slides. I was going to do a Q&A, &A, but I'm aware that we're going to be doing that at the end of the webinar. So I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Very well done. Um, this is a very exciting project for um, for NELFT and, um, and I'm happy to be part of it. Um, right, so we have a question and answer um, box at the side, um, which we would love to hear your questions. And um, if you if you want to fill them in, uh, we can do that. We have another speaker, um, Martin Lever, but unfortunately, um, we have had a problem with Martin getting access, so um, so we are open now to questions and um, from anybody in in the audience. So you're welcome to write them, unless you're having problems writing questions because we've had no questions, which is unusual. So Jenny, this is Sari working behind the scenes. Uh, so thank you to everyone who's spoken so far. It's been really interesting. As you flagged, we don't have any questions, but what might be quite nice is to do a bit of a discussion between you and your presenter colleagues about any typical questions that have come in in the past or sort of common myths that you'd like to challenge or flag up. No problem. Um, I think. Um, that's a great great question um so okay so things that are coming up at the moment uh we have had um quite a number of questions around clozapine um and how we manage clozapine uh recently so there was a, an article in the news last week about clozapine and um and when you stop smoking um when you stop smoking, your clozapine levels increase and how you manage that. So it's really important to um, to raise awareness uh, with patients and with carers and with staff that they're asking questions um, for patients who are on clozapine to make sure that they um, understand that if they get um, uh, constipation, this is a sign um, that clozapine levels are too high. It can be a sign. Um, and so they, these are questions that need to be asked and they should be having regular blood tests to check their clozapine levels. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has anything that they want to add on clozapine. I think we have a couple of questions. I could, yeah, I could add to that, Jenny. So, um, uh, so if people stop smoking and they're on clozapine, then so you need to be led by their, their plasma level, but you will usually need to reduce their dose of clozapine in that first week, providing they're not, you know, stopping and starting, stopping and starting um, their smoking. And the thing you need to be worried about with clozapine and olanzapine, because structurally it's quite uh, similar, um, is seizures, because it all it all it affects the, the seizure threshold. So out of all the side effects you worried about with clozapine and smoking, it, it's people having seizures. So make sure you kind of you, you, you're checking people's plasma levels in that in that first week. And those plasma levels can continue to change for about six months. So when um, when trusts went smoke free back in 2007 and the special hospitals so ramped and Broadmoor Ashworth went smoke free and all the other mental health hospitals kind of threw their arms up in the air and said, you know, we can't possibly go smoke free. We learned a lot 
uh, for, from smoking and causing pain from, from the secure hospitals. And so even when people weren't getting access to cigarettes and they stopped smoking, their clozapine levels were still changing for about six months. So it's something you kind of need to, to monitor uh, long term. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Deborah, for your answer. That was um, very comprehensive. Um, OK, so we have a question, which is, would you recommend NRT such as lozenges or vapes for people? So. So I personally would recommend either or both, either individually or both together, depending on the level of someone's tobacco dependence. Um, they're not contraindicated to be used together. Brilliant. I'm also happy to take that vaping question as well. Well, if I can just say a little bit more about NRT. So um, when you smoke cigarettes, um, you get 2.3 milligrams of nicotine. So the best patch is 0.98. You never get from a patch what you get from a cigarette, but you get a constant stream. So as Debbie um, said earlier, you have nicotine withdrawal um, after about 20 minutes you go into nicotine withdrawal which sends your body into a stressor um, being in stressor uh, puts you in more anxious you know you're you're in fight or flight mode your um, adrenaline levels go up you're you're more stressed um, so if you have a constant stream of nicotine you don't go into withdrawal so things are calmer much quicker um, and then you would use that in combination with another product like a uh, lozenge or a vape or um, another oral product. Um, thank you, De Debbie, you, you said you'd like to take the next question. So it seems that smoking cessation programmes encourage switching to vapes. However, I thought that vapes were also very bad for health, um, e.g. popcorn, lung, etc. Any comments on this would be helpful. Um. So yeah, it's it's a good question and a question uh, we often get asked. So I think the the first thing to say is vaping doesn't cause popcorn lung, and smoking doesn't cause popcorn lung. But it's in, it, it's a myth that's persisted for years. So where this kind of originated is there was a group of popcorn factory workers in America, and. Uh, and, and and it's this is still contested, but uh, a few of them developed a lung condition called uh, bronchiolitis obliterans, and it was colloquial, colloquially called uh, called popcorn lung because it happened in popcorn factory workers from breathing in a chemical, the buttery flavouring from uh, popcorn, so a chemical called diacetyl, uh, and then. Uh, Someone did some research to look at what was in e-liquids and they found uh, in some vapes diacetyl was in those e-liquids. And so then people made this big cognitive leap that if diacetyl is in e-liquids and some popcorn factory workers uh, have been getting bronchiolitis obliterans, therefore vaping must cause this so-called popcorn lung. But there's never been any cases of popcorn lung in vaping um, or in, in smoking. What there has been is some acute lung injuries um, from vaping, but that has been linked to vaping cannabis. So uh, THC contaminated with vitamin E uh, acetate. So it's I, I guess when we're having conversations with with patients, it's really important to give them accurate information that they might, you know, see in so, or on social media or you know, on, on TikTok. Um, so in terms of uh, vaping's effectiveness as a smoking cessation aid, um, vaping's more effective than nicotine replacement therapy uh, and more effective than behavioural support. And it's recommended as first line treatment by NICE, um, similar to nicotine replacement therapy um, or varenicline. So health policy in this country supports vaping for adults who smoke as a smoking cessation tool, uh, but they don't recommend it for young people who've never smoked or, or adults who've never smoked unless they would otherwise take up smoking. Thank you very much, Deborah. That was a very comprehensive reply to that. Um, and I feel like I've learned 
um, today from you as well. So that's brilliant. Um, right. So the next question was any practical tips on stopping reducing smoking when supporting clients with their mental health, apart from referring them to a smoking cessation service? Anyone want to take that? OK, I'll, I'll have a go, um, which is um, I think having the conversation, if you're speaking to patients about their smoking, then they know that it's important when you don't speak about it, it or you say, you know, let's not worry about that. I think that is when patients think that it's not something that they need to, to change. And as you've heard here today, um, smoking impacts quite severely mental health, it impacts physical health um, and it impacts their financial health. So cigarettes are now almost £20 a packet. So that is a huge cause of deprivation. And if you was to say to your patients that you could help them have an extra 70, 80 pounds in their pocket a week, they would bite your hand off. Um, and this, so having those conversations, starting to have those conversations, I think is really, really important. Um, hope that's answered. Um, OK, so what's the most difficult aspects of supporting patients with SMI to understand how nicotine affects their mental health? Would someone like to answer that? Well, I guess we know how we know how smoking affects people's mental health. We know what what tobacco smoking does. So that there, there hasn't been a lot of studies where you uncouple nicotine from tobacco smoke. Uh, and look at the effects uh, on mental health. So um, short term low doses of nicotine uh, helps people's levels of concentration and cognitive ability. The problem is when it's coupled with when nicotine is coupled with with tobacco smoke, um, that has more effect uh, on people's mental health. So as I kind of alluded to my presentation, people with psychosis will have more severe symptoms of psychosis. You're more likely to be depressed. You're more likely to be anxious. Um, so if if you can if if you can reduce how much you smoke and uh, and particularly quit, then you're going to take away uh, some of those mental health uh, problems. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, right, so Tracy Parr has put in the question and answers uh, that the London Tobacco Alliance has a respiratory uh, specialist discussing the myths around popcorn lung, and they are happy to share that video um, or information with us afterwards, which is fantastic as well. Um, and someone has asked, are there any health concerns from using patches or lozenges long term? So would anyone from the panel like to answer that? Um, I'm yeah, I can uh, answer that. So that there, there aren't any long term concerns from using patches and lozenges, even with people with cardiovascular disease. Um, so nice guidelines recommend uh, long term use if it's going to prevent people returning back to smoking. I think the longest studies there's been around say nicotine replacement therapy is about seven years uh, without any particular uh, increase in risk. It tends to be people tend not to use patches long term. It tends to be the the faster acting products that people might lose uh, use long term or, or be dependent on. So I think overall about five percent of people that prescribed NRT will continue to use it um, long term. But um, and also I, I guess thinking about concurrent use of NRT and smoking, that's often a, a question we get asked or what we see in clinical practice. So you might prescribe somebody nicotine replacement therapy and then the prescriber sees them smoking in the hospital ground. So they'll they'll discontinue the NRT off their drug chart rather than work really hard to, to, to get people to stop smoking. But NRT is is licensed for smoking reduction as well. Um, and NRT uh, and, and, and smoking together or NRT and vaping together doesn't seem to increase your nicotine intake because people who smoke, they're very good and adept at titrating their own levels of nicotine and balancing their own levels of nicotine out. 
Yeah, no, that's an excellent answer. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, OK, so the next question is access to cigarettes is a massive problem. Holding tobacco on the wards and handling out to patients during periods of leave or discharge seriously undermines individuals attempts to quit reduce tobacco intake and makes it harder to implement smoke free policies. Given the recent addition in the CQC guidance redestruction of smoking to uh, materials, how confident do people feel that trust will be able to implement necessary changes to policies? Would anyone like to take that question? OK, so one of the things, sorry, you were going to no, say, no, go, no, go, go on, on Jenny. Go on. <laughs> no, I'm doing a lot of talking. You'll, you'll be sick of me voice. <laughs> Never, absolutely not. OK, so um, in NELFT, we have um, our smoke free policy and um, it doesn't say to destruct, um, to destroy the tobacco. And I completely agree. I think that um, when patients um, come into hospital, um, they, if they have alcohol on them, alcohol is treated very differently to tobacco. Um, alcohol will be destroyed or thrown away, um, whereas tobacco is, um, is kept and given to patients. And I think if we look at environment, environment really impacts um, people with uh, substance misuse or any kind of addiction. And um, when they come into hospital, they are in a completely different environment and can often make some very, very good changes. And then as soon as they go back out into their own environment, if they have access to their medicate, their uh, addiction, whatever it is, including tobacco, um, then they are more likely to be triggered to use that again. Um, so if we can change the policy that it's destroyed with the patient's consent rather than posting it home to the patient's front door as soon as they walk in the door it's there or given to the patients to take home I think that can be a really really beneficial way but it it has to work with changing staff's opinion. Um, staff have to get on board with um, tobacco um, and, and the idea that tobacco really impacts mental health we still have some attitude towards tobacco that it's um it's a lifestyle choice or um tobacco is the only thing that people have in their lives and actually people have a lot more in their lives um and can use tobacco in many you know they can use their lives to to be much more healthier than using tobacco as a coping strategy um so i hope that answers it i'm not sure it did but um deborah did you want to add anything else no, I think I think they're really good points, Jenny. I think that. Um, so I, it, CQC, from my understanding, is that they haven't they, they've not come down in one position about destroying tobacco, but it sounds like they're, they're, they're creating loopholes for trusts to to do their own things. So I think we'll probably still see a lot of inconsistency. Uh, uh, ac across 54 mental health trusts and I think if you've got a really good tobacco dependence treatment pathway in place and you're doing things like the initiatives that NELF are taking and you've got a really competent workforce and you've got really strong visible leadership in your trust then you should have confidence that y you can kind of work towards not store in tobacco and I think as long as so I remember back in 2013 when we were discussing with this with SLAM and they went to their trust lawyers about not storing tobacco and, and, and destroy it destroying it what the lawyers said was that providing you warning people that you know we're a trust that don't store tobacco so in all your you know what they were su suggesting in all your correspondence with patients, in all kind of your leaflets on your website, you're very clear about this, um, then there would be less risk of 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 a legal of a legal challenge. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Deborah. OK, so we have a champion who has volunteered um, as tribute, which is Emma Barry. She's going to take over and deliver uh, Martin's slides um, in his absence. So I'd like to introduce you to, to Emma Barry. 
Thank you. And I understand Martin's having quite a few technical difficulties, so we have been trying. So, um, so yeah, um, I'm going to talk about the some of the resources and training and additional support that's available out there um, for you guys to, to access. So next slide, please. So there's quite a lot of resources out there. So ASH, who are, for those of you who don't know, are the Action on Smoking and Health um, group, and they have a mental health and smoking partnership. They have these partnerships for a couple of other uh, different programs like pregnancy as well. But there's a huge amount of resource in there. So when you receive these slides afterwards, these uh, links will, will click through. But the Mental Health and Smoking Partnership has a lot of um, different resources. Uh, it will always have different um, webinars and information and updated guidance on supporting um, supporting mental health workers who uh, want to talk about patients with smoking. So that's a really good um, line of access. Um, the Mental Health Foundation also has a good um, program of work and a lot of resources around supporting uh, patients with mental health issues around their smoking. So I recommend you look at that one. The government website also has a really uh, good information around some of the issues that we've talked about today around smoking and mental health and some of the guidance around now, um, as well as the Royal College of Physicians. There's lots of resources available to help you guys tap into some of that information. Uh, next slide, please. So the ASH, uh, the Stolen Years report was published a few years ago now, back in sort of 2016, I believe. Um, so this is was one of the really key reports that helped to highlight some of the issues we have with um, with smoking in patients with mental health, and this highlight this was the the report that really helped to highlight some of the um, some of the health issues that um, mental health patients have with their smoking, and really helped to bring that to to the forefront. So this was one of the key drivers to helping to bring um, bring this to uh, to the attention of uh, mental health workers and just raise that as an issue. Um, the Royal College of Physicians also had uh, a report around smoking and mental health and the CALM review, which was one of the key drivers published back in 2021, that's helped to inform some of the uh, government uh, consultation work around tackling smoking, has also um, highlighted some of the importance of uh, ta tackling um, smoking in patients with mental health issues as well. So if you could go to the next slide for me. Thank you. So again, there's lots of information uh, for s smokers as well. So for some of the specialist teams, if you look on, so people like Thrive, there's lots of different information available um, through uh, the mental health trust that can uh, provide that support. Stop Smoking London will also link through to support around quitting smoking. So this is uh, for smokers to access, as well as the NHS Better Health um, uh, website. Now these will obviously be slightly less uh, tailored to, to mental health programs, but lots of information there about accessing support. So I think one of the key things we've talked about here with mental health patients is they are less likely to feel confident around their, their ability to quit smoking and may need slightly more intensive uh, support to help them along, uh, along their journey. So they may be better off accessing local support services. So the Stop Smoking London website is a fantastic resource that allows smokers to find their local um, Stop Smoking service or they can contact the helpline, which will also help to signpost them to, to that support as well. Um, smokers can also use the NHS Quit Smoking app, which will help to give them motivational tips, help them to track their quitting journey and uh, support them through through their uh, their programme they may be accessing elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. 
And the NCSCT, so for those who don't know, this is the National Centre for Smoking Cessation Training, has a huge amount of uh, resource and information on there. But on their training section, they have a number of different programmes that will help to support uh, people when it comes to dealing with uh, patients with mental health issues. So they've got their core uh, practitioner training programme, which gives everyone who accesses the programme a really broad understanding of how to have a conversation with people around tackling their smoking, help to understand around the, the different medications and treatments on there and give people who want to be able to support people around quitting smoking all the skills and understanding and knowledge that they need, uh, need to do that. There is also a mental health and smoking cessation specialist module. So anyone who's working specifically with mental health patients, whether that's in, uh, in an inpatient setting or out in the community, it is recommended to do that, that specialist module as well, um, because it will give you a much more tailored information um, that you wouldn't necessarily get through the core program. And there are also a number of very brief advice modules to allow support workers to be able to have a conversation um, to address someone smoking without going into the detail of actually providing that support to help signpost people on how to action um, uh, and address their, their smoking and how to access um, support services. There is a specialist one for people um, who are experiencing homelessness because we do know that there's a high um, level of poor mental health in people who are experiencing homelessness. So there is a very tailored, uh, very brief advice module there, as well as the more general one for health and social care um, uh, workers on, on the NCSCT website as well. Uh, so the next slide, please. Lovely. And uh, sorry, there's a couple of other slides I just want to go to. So if you can skip to um, skip to the next one. Thank you. So that's it. Just to reiterate some of the um, key messages that we've we've talked about today. So there's a high smoking prevalence among people with mental health issues. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that they're using that uh, to self-medicate. Um, so therefore, smoking is not an effective means of managing their health condition and that stopping smoking is one of the most powerful drivers for, um, for better mental health. And the final slide, please, for me. So, <coughs> excuse me, the key message is stopping smoking can significantly improve their mental health. Um, for most smokers, it can take several attempts to quit smoking and some patients with mental health issues may need to have more than one attempt to help them to quit smoking. And there's a lot of ways that we can tailor and adapt that support. So some of these smokers may be um, may be able to sort of cut down their smoking before they make that full quit attempt. And for people with uh, mental health issues, this can be quite um, quite a common technique to help them to address their smoking in stages rather than quitting smoking straight away. But I believe that's the last of Martin's slides, so thank you. Well done, Emma. A, um, a very good sec <coughs> second for Martin Lieber there. Um, well done. Thank you very much for presenting that. Um, we have a couple more questions in the chat, <coughs> which is, um, right, so is there an alternative for smoking? What can we recommend as an alternative? So would anyone like to answer that? I'm happy to pick up on, on that one, Jenny. So I know we've talked about um, vapes. So what we do know is that vapes are significantly um, better and safer than continuing to smoke smoke, uh, continuing to smoke cigarettes. So if that person is not quite ready to completely quit smoking, then the best thing for that person to do will be to switch to vaping. Um, and that will reduce the risk of long term harm that this continued smoking will, will um, bring. So that's probably one of the best things that they can do if they're not quite ready to quit. Fantastic. And breathing techniques is a very good alternative um, as a coping strategy, um, doing exercise, you know, so alternative um, that you what you would do is you would identify what motivates the individual. So what are they interested in? Are they interested in, um, you know, 
feeling better do they you know do they like uh, photography do they what what is it that they like and find that motivation for them um, and then you can work and build on that um, but breathing techniques can be very good because when you stop smoking you have nearly a third more oxygen in your body um, after 24 hours so all the carbon monoxide has left the body which means that you heal quicker you breathe better it may not feel like that initially because you're probably going to be expelling a lot of tar and stuff but um, so breathing if you can enhance your breathing lungs are a muscle like every other organ in the body so it's really good to improve them um, I think we've got Room from one more. Um, OK, is there any advice that you can help clients to manage cravings? Does anybody want to answer that? OK, so what I would recommend if someone's managing their cravings is to use the medication, um, use the vapes, use the, uh, the nicotine replacement therapy. And remember that um, we have receptors in the brain that are craving it and looking for it. And after about seven days, they will go to sleep. After 28 days, it's like they go into a coma. So um, so that's, you know, it's only temporary. The cravings will go. Um, so you have two forms of addiction with smoking. You have the physical um, and then you have the psychological. So giving them alternatives to do with their hands, drinking water instead of having a cigarette will help um, them to change that, that, um, that pattern of behaviour. Um, anybody want to add anything to that? Jenny, I'm, you... quite, I'm quite happy to add to that one as well. So as Jenny pointed out, it's not just about the nicotine addiction, but smokers have, particularly if they've been smoking for a long time, have built up so many routines and habits around their smoking. So some of these cravings are also down to these psychological cues they have um, throughout the day around their smoking so it could be that they've built smoking into their patterns of behavior as well so something that can help to manage those cravings on top of making sure that they've got sufficient um, nicotine um, support to re reduce the withdrawal symptoms can be looking at those individual uh, triggers making tweaks and changes to their routine and that can help to make it easier for them so that they can concentrate on um, you know, overcoming those symptoms a little bit more easily. So we would, uh, in a stop smoking cessation service, they will quite often talk to them about their individual triggers, their individual routines, um, and help to help them to find ways of dealing with that as well. Thank you very much, Emma. That's brilliant. Deborah, you put your camera on. Did you want to add anything else to that? No, I was just going to say something similar uh, to okay. Emma. I, I guess in inpatient services then, we need to be kind of telling patients to to expect um, withdrawal symptoms and what to what to expect and how to tell the difference between withdrawal symptoms and maybe his mental health symptoms. And also that we need to get ahead. We need to prevent cravings, not just kind of respond to cravings or people. And sometimes this is tricky depending on how engaged your pharmacies are, but you need to give people fingertip control over their nicotine just as they would have fingertip control uh, at home with, with, with their cigarettes or a plentiful supply of nicotine replacement therapy or vapes and not, not restricting those. And then, as Emma said, just reducing smoking cues. Um, whether you're at home or on a ward and some of the, you know, going back to the previous CQC question, a smoking cue is knowing you've got your tobacco pouch in the nursing office, in their drawer. Um, uh, yeah, so 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 address it, addressing those things. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Deborah. OK, well, I'd really like to thank our speakers, uh, Deborah Robson, um, Zoe Townsend, uh, <laughs> Emma Barry for stepping in for Martin Lever. Um, she did a great job. Um, I'd like to thank John Winter from Thrive for organising today. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, if there's any questions that we haven't answered, what we'll do is we'll reply via our email. We're going to send out all the slides. Um, so thank you very much for coming and um, I hope you all have a very good day. <laughs>